Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Explore Classroom. My name is Joe Gorowski from National Geographic, and I will be your host for today. Really excited for today's Hangout from the Field. It's a repeat of one we did last week. It was so much fun. Uh, we had to do it again. Uh, we're going to meet Pablo in just a second. He's got one of our textbook size satellite BGAN units in Argentina, in Patagonia. He's using it to connect to a satellite and broadcast us to us live from uh, one of his field sites. But before we do meet him, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to go to National Geographic's Mapmaker Interactive and we're going to take a little look at where our classrooms are joining us live from today. So here you should be able to see Alora, Ontario. That's me at the red X. As we start backing out, you're going to see a few more of our classrooms. We've got classrooms in Aurora, Mississauga and Guelph, Ontario. We back out a little bit more. Uh, Vermilion Bay is joining us as well in Ontario. Then you can see a few more classrooms we have here in Illinois, Virginia, New Jersey, uh, as well as Massachusetts. And if we go nice and down south, we're going to go to Argentina. And we have an X approximately where Pablo is joining us live from today. So as I end the screen share, I can see our YouTube viewers are starting to climb. If you are tuning in live uh, via YouTube, you can still get in on the action. Send us in some questions via the YouTube chat sidebar. Um, and we'll get to some of them. Let us know where you're watching from. Any classrooms viewing today, uh, use the hashtag explore classroom, tag at Nacho Education. Uh, we'd love to see your classrooms in action. So we are going to start our hangout now. We are joining Pablo uh, Borborglu. He's the founder and president of Global Penguin Society, an international science-based conservation coalition that protects the world's penguin species. Since 1989, he's worked in the fields of marine conservation. He leads a global conservation effort to benefit penguins in several countries and at different scales, including the creation of large marine protected areas on the land and in the ocean uh, to improve the management of penguin colonies. So Pablo, I hear your friends joining us already today. We're so excited to have you and we can't wait to hear and see what you're up to. Excellent. Thank you very much, Joe, and I'm so happy, so happy that all of you from all over the planet are joining us here. We are live. I am, as Joe showed you, in Argentina, in Patagonia. This is almost the, the end of the planet, <laughs> the end of the world. And uh, this is the province of Chubut. Um, we are in the coastal side of Patagonia. I am facing the Atlantic Ocean that I'm going to show you later a little bit. And guess where I am now? Listen to that. That's the fantastic sound of the penguins. The, I am in the middle of Magellanic penguin colony in, in Argentina. Uh, this is, it's very busy here because they are in the middle of the breeding season. So I am, I am surrounded by lots of thousands and thousands of, of nests. And I'm going to tell you uh, uh, more about that uh, during our talk. And, and today I want to show you, I'm going to switch the skin. So I want to show you the landscape first. And as you can see, it's a perfect day just for you. There's no wind here. Normally it's very windy, but not today. You see the ocean. This is the, the Atlantic Ocean. All the bushes are part of the colony. And if you take a look, I'm showing. Can you see the image well, Joe? Is it, is it okay, the, the image, or is it too pixeled? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's not too bad. We can see the ocean and the land, but the details are a tiny bit pixelated. Okay, we're going to see penguins very close, so don't worry about that. And so there are penguins all along this coast because they come and go to the ocean uh, and to the colony. And here we start seeing some of our friends, you know, the, I am surrounded by a lot of, of penguins. And I'm going to talk to you about the chicks and the penguins later. But now I want to start telling you about the landscape that they use. And before we do that, I want you to introduce, I am here with two friends, two fantastic journalists, <laughs> Marina and Ruben. They are journalists from the, a, news, a magazine that belongs to the main newspaper of Argentina. So it's fantastic that they are joining us and they are covering this live. <laughs> so thank you, Marina and Ruben, for joining us. And I want to show you the landscape where the penguins live, because normally we think that penguins like the ice, right? Because maybe you've seen happy feet or you have seen the march of the penguins, you know, penguins surrounded by ice, iceberg. But you know what? There are 18 species of penguins and only four kind of like the ice temperatures. But 14 species of penguins, they don't like the ice. They don't like cold temperatures. And what the Magellanic penguins, the ones that 
uh, that breathe here, they don't like cold temperatures. Like, for example, these ones that we see here. So, as you can see, let's look into this nest, for example. Here we see a typical nest of one of these penguins. See? This penguin is panting because today is kind of warm. It is for 25, more, 25 degrees centigrade. So, you can convert that to Fahrenheit in your classes <laughs> and tell me later how many Fahrenheit are 25 Celsius. And these penguins, if you see, they nest in caves, like in this case, and some others may nest on the bushes, like those ones over there. The main thing for them is that they want to be protected from the sun uh, to reduce the exposure uh, to the sun because it gets very warm, particularly when they have chicks. They want the chicks to be under the shade. And of course, they need to have roof and protection from aerial predators like other seagulls that come to their colonies to steal their eggs and also to, to, to steal and eat their chicks. So a good nest, it's a kind of uh, a guarantee that the chicks are going to survive. So this is very interesting because you know that the, when the breeding season starts in October, the males arrive first to these colonies and they fight a lot for their nests. Uh, they get quite aggressive, let me tell you. Say that, so they, they attack each other, there's kind of, there's blood in, in, involved. Sometimes they lose their eyes, uh, their eyes. And the other thing is like, um, they fight a lot because the, um, the nest is like the key to have a good female. So the females, to select the males, they pay attention to the quality of the nest. That is the reason why the males fight so much. So then the females come, the, and the, she is going to lay two eggs, only two eggs. And let me show you this, because this is fantastic. Here is a nest with one egg. Do you see that? And unfortunately, this egg will not hatch. It's an abandoned nest. It's been raining a lot yesterday. And so this nest, sorry, this egg should have hatched like 20 days ago or less. So, but I want to get the egg so you can see the size compared to my hand. This is like twice the size of a chicken egg, you see? The, the, the eggshell is quite thick. Hmm? And the, the interesting thing is that when they are hatching the eggs, the, the males and the females, they collect branches and they also collect leaves. So they kind of look for furniture for their nest because they want to make like a mattress so the eggs won't break when they are incubating them, see? So when the, when the eggs are laid, the males and the females, they take shifts. So when the male is incubating the eggs, she is out in the ocean looking for food. And then when she comes back, he goes. And that uh, is the same system they use for three months. But when the chicks hatch, and I'm going to show you the chicks now. Let's see. This is quite hidden. But let's look for another nest. Let's see. Oh, there's a chick here. When the chicks hatch, oh, they are kind of hidden from the sun. But I don't know if you can see. Let me show you this. Here you have two chicks and one adult taking care of them. You see the, the body of a chick and you see two heads appearing. Let me show you. I have a stick. Let me get the stick so I can point you where to look. So I was telling you that when the chicks hatch, they have to be fed every day or every day and a half. There you go. So here is the, here is the adult. Do you see my stick here? Yes. So here is the adult. Here's the back part of a chick. You, need, you see with the fluffy feathers. This is the head of the chick. Oh, the chick is coming. Oh, he's getting my stick. This is the bill of the chick. And this is the small flipper. You see? A small flipper of one of the chicks. Hmm? Uh, but they're running away from me. <laughs> so I was telling you that when the chicks are small, and, and here is the father, you know, looking out from the window to see what's going on in the neighborhood. So when the chicks are small, they have to be fed very frequently. So they, they, the adults, they go to the ocean uh, and they have to look for food. Sometimes they swim and they, 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 they have to swim hundreds of kilometers to get the food come with the food pre-digested in their stomachs, and then they come to the colony and feed the chicks. And the way they feed the chicks is, they re is what we call regurgitation. 
it's like a similar to a vomit, but it's not a vomit, you know. Um, so that's the way they, they transfer the food. They feed their chicks, you know, mouth to mouth. And the, the, the sad thing is that it takes a lot of effort for the adults to get the food. Imagine swimming hundreds of kilometers and diving. These animals, they can dive 140 meters under the surface of the ocean. But when they come here, if their chicks are not smart or if the adults are not very experienced, if the food fails on the ground, it will be lost because the chicks will not pick it up and the adults will not pick it up. So it's lost food and other seabirds like gulls and other species, they come and take advantage of that food. And that is very sad because sometimes the chicks starve to death uh, because they don't know how to pick up the, the food from, from, from the sun. So I want to, to show you now other, maybe there's bigger chicks here. Hey, Poppy, your there finger's see... in front of the camera lens. Oh, thank you very much. That's better. What about that? Thank you, thank you. So here we see a bigger chick and, and a male. Let me... So you see the chick there. Oh, it's hiding now. And the male coming into the nest. So as you can see, the adults, they take care of the chicks a lot because it's their main capital. So yesterday it has been raining a lot in this place. Uh, so one of the important things for the penguins is that they have to look for good uh, soil. They have to pay attention to the quality of the soil when they decide to, to build a nest, to dig a nest, because sometimes the nest collapses and, and they, they can also die when they, the, the nest collapses. So I want to show you here because I saw a chick here. Can you listen to the chicks peeping? Oh. Well, if you could listen to that, that's the way they ask for food. And let me tell you a, a very nice story about this colony. Um, I'm going to switch it so you can see. There we go. I switched the hand as well. <laughs> so we found this cover. We discovered this colony 10 years ago. And there were only six pairs of nests. But the place was a complete mess, believe me. Because it was used by reckless people and, and careless fishermen that were coming here. There were lots of garbage, glasses, plastic bottles. They would, uh, they would make barbecues and set fire very close to the nests of these penguins. They were coming with dogs that could kill a penguin in very, very quickly. So there were only six pairs of nests. And those founder groups, those, that first group of penguins, they are prospecting, they're looking for a safe place and they were deciding if they were going to stay. So we needed to protect the colony. And the, the thing is that in that moment, there wasn't a, a, a tool, you know, a legal tool to protect it. So we decided to close the gate. So they, the fishermen, they couldn't have access to this colony, so we needed to protect that. And it wasn't easy because some people started to come with guns because they wanted to hunt. Some other people were, were really angry because we, we, were, we, we didn't allow them to, to continue coming here. They would cut the fences. They would put glue on our lockers. But the good news is that the colony, year after year, started to continue growing. And, and then we also fostered, we promoted the, the development of, uh, of ecotourism, of people that come here in small groups and they enjoy the penguins. And that created jobs for 10 local people. And that is creating a lot of money for the local economies. So this was a great example of how we can use science to make conservation, protect the penguins, but also benefit the local people because we create jobs and, and generate money for them. So this is a great conservation and successful story. Um, and that is why I, I kind of come here to show you this story. And we work together with the owners of this place. We did the management plan. They respect that a lot. So this is a, a great story. And guess what? We counted this colony last month. And remember I told you there were six, only six pairs of nests 10 years ago. And now we counted 1,860 pairs. So that is amazing. And first of all, sorry, first of all, the first six nests were here, were in the place where I am now. But now, when we census the colony, we have to walk up to almost three kilometers into that 
landscape that you can see because then the penguins they don't stay all the time close to their colonies they walk and some of the nests are one kilometer far inland so what is important to know is that as i told you at the beginning there are 18 species of penguins and the sad news is that more than half of them are considered threatened you know that it means that the populations are declining there, there are less penguins of those species and uh, and that's really sad to know and the problem with the penguins is that they go into the ocean and they also come on land so they are facing threats in both places basically the problem when they are in the ocean is that the the um, climate change because climate change is kind of moving uh, the fish out from the colonies you know it's changing the, the the place and the moment where food is available and the other problem is oil pollution in the past the main problem was pollution by oil uh, and now it's plastic pollution because here in this same colony we found penguins that were stuck and they have um, some of them they have plastic bottles around their necks and some others were uh, really choking because they have like uh, plastic uh, bags around their their throats so that that's another problem that penguins are facing and in the ocean they are also facing problems with the fisheries because the some fisheries they compete for food so the they are catching the same food that is needed for the penguins. And, but that's not the end of the story because when the penguins come on land, they have to face um, problems like human disturbance. People, like I told you, in this, in this same colony, people that come to these areas, they don't respect the penguins, they, they come to hunt, they don't know how to enjoy the environment and protect the wildlife. Uh, and some other, in some other areas, Penguins are facing problems because they are introduced predators. You know, like uh, penguins, they evolved, you know, that they, during 60, more than 60 million years. And they could do that because they were living uh, in places without predators. That's the reason they don't fly. They didn't need to fly because they live in places where there were no predators, like foxes, like pumas, for example. So the problem is that when human beings, we started to conquer or, or, or go to or move to those uh, islands, uh, we introduced a lot of animals. Uh, and I'll give you one example. In New Zealand, for example, uh, there are uh, 4 million people and there are 70 million possums, 70 million animals that are introduced and they eat lots of chicks from many birds, not only penguins. So that is a big, big problem. And I'm gonna move a little bit I hope that I don't lose the connection. And I want to show you this. Let me see. So no here problem. we have. Uh, okay, okay, I'm losing. Okay, I'm back. I'm coming no, no, back. Keep, keep going, Poppy. It was working. I was saying so okay. far, so good. Ah, okay, sorry. Okay, so there was a, a, an interesting interaction between two couples. You know, because they're very social birds. So he. All right, Pablo, if you can hear me, I think that was the limit. I think you found the line. So if you can back up a little bit for us uh, and come back. But yeah, we, we pushed okay, I'm it. coming back. Right, we <laughs> pushed too far. a little too far. Yeah, yeah, sorry about it. So anyway, we have here two friends coming back from the ocean, you see. So this is the typical life, the, what they do in, in one of the days. They go, most of them, they go uh, early in the morning to look for food. They eat as much as they can. In some colonies, they swim 150 kilometers in one trip or more. Uh, this is a new kind of new colony. And these penguins, they swim and they find food very social bird coming hello yeah. curious you know people, the, to people that do not harm them so they like so you see they, they are coming to me <laughs> so, so these penguins they, they then they go to the oceans and they, they feed their chicks and uh, during the rest of the day when as I told you when the, one of the members of the pair is out
only moment when have it's very that moment is their ocean, a beach, the beach, and when the breeze scan the temperature in the nest. You see? And that's one of the issues that we see maybe related with climate change. Uh, we have more days of extreme temperatures. And some of the penguins are very healthy, they're in great conditions, but some of them, in those hot days, they die uh, from heart attacks on their way. I mean, because it's too, it gets too hot for them. So here they go again. And Another interesting thing from the penguins is that they have their personalities, you know. No, they're not all the same. Some of them, when we, we work with them and we have to ban them, we have to weigh them, they, I wouldn't say they'd like it, but they, they don't bother. They're not, they don't get so angry. But some others, they really don't like to be, to be <laughs> touched or measured or whatever. And there was even one, in one of the field sites, there was even one penguin that was very, very social. And believe me, he was, he knocked at our door. He was coming into the, into the camp, into the house, looking for laces and looking for material so he could furnish his nest. Uh, and that's very interesting because you can see the differences. And some of the penguins, when you walk on the colonies, they really run away, you know, very fast. They run away from you. And here we have another, another penguin. So normally, these penguins, they are for, so you can have an idea, they are 45 centimeters tall. Hmm? And they weigh, if they are in a very good condition, they weigh five kilograms, more or less. And here we see, I'm going to show you this. There are two chicks in this nest. So, so that you can see the face of one on the, on the left of the camera. And you can see the eye of the adult. So let me tell you, this is one of the most aggressive penguin species. Uh, you see the chick there showing up. See it? <laughs> it's all fluffy. You know, these penguins, the chicks, the feathers are not waterproof yet. So when it rains, if they get wet, they, get, they, they are cold. Mm? So the thing is that they are going to have this kind of uh, feathers uh, until they are three months old. By then, they're going to, the adults, they are really, really skinny because they have been uh, feeding them, taking care of them. But they, when the chicks are three months old, the adults abandon them and the chicks go out to the ocean. And before that, they change all the feathers. These soft feathers are lost and they're going to get the new plumage, which is waterproof. So when they go into the ocean, the good news is that with those feathers, they're not going to be cold because the water doesn't touch the skin. Mm? As, and the, the other thing is that they have air among the feathers. So they float like a cork. And these penguins, when the winter comes here in Patagonia and it gets cold, guess what? They don't stay here. They go to Brazil. <laughs> and they spend six months in the water, floating and eating, and they even sleep floating. They only show up in, on the, along the coast if they get oil or if they are sick. But the rest of them, the rest of the healthy ones, they just spend six months in the water because they are seabirds. And these penguins, they spend between 75, 80% of their lives in the ocean. And look at this guy, see, it's kind of hot. They don't sweat like human beings. They don't sweat like us. So the only way to dissipate the heat, to eliminate the heat from their body, is to pant like that, you know, opening their bills and breathing. And if you take a look, a closer look, you see the place around the bill, around the eyes, you, you see a part that is pink. That is a part of their body, of, of their heads. When they come here and it gets cold, when it gets very hot, they lose those feathers. So they also dissipate heat. They lose heat through that part of uh, skin that doesn't have feathers. So, excellent. And this is all that I have to tell you about these guys. And I'm so looking forward to your questions now. <laughs> all right. Well, Poppy, thanks so much for showing us uh, the colony. It's amazing to see 
Uh, that egg, the chick, the the parents coming from the beach. That was pretty awesome. So thanks so much for sharing that with us today. <laughs> All right. Well, let's meet some of our live classrooms. Just a reminder, to any classrooms who are watching uh, live on YouTube, send in your location and some questions. I'll give a quick shout out to some classrooms. We've got a classroom in Central Minnesota, in Durham, North Carolina, in Florida, uh, seventh graders uh, in Randolph, Ontario. We've got, let's see. Pauline Johnson Public School in Burlington, Ontario. We've got class in Kansas. So you have lots of classrooms joining us and don't forget to send those questions in. We're gonna start with Mrs. Gully's class from grade fives who are joining us from Rose Hill, Virginia. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing grade fives? We're good. All right, who's got a question? Pick up there. How many species of penguins are there? How many species of penguins are there? Did you get how many species of penguins are there? Yep. How many species are there in this in this colony, right? I think they want to know all together. Like worldwide. Ah, okay. There are 18 species of penguins in all the planet. But uh, the interesting thing is that they only live in the southern hemisphere. So they live in Antarctica, in South Africa, in Australia and New Zealand, and in South America. And you have penguins from the cold Antarctica up to tropical Galapagos, in the Galapagos Island in Ecuador. So, but they, you don't, there are no penguins in the northern hemisphere. Uh, and one theory is that the penguins, since they couldn't fly, uh, they couldn't live in the northern hemisphere because there used to be more predators. That's the reason why they only live in, in the Southern Hemisphere. All right, great question. Let's go now. We've got two classrooms in Drakat, Massachusetts, grade twos with Mrs. Porcello and Mrs. Cook. Uh, if you can just turn your microphone on for me and say hi, and then we'll grab a question. Oh, can you try again for me, uh, Massachusetts? I can see you waving like crazy, but uh, I don't think the microphone turned on. Hi. That's better. <laughs> All right, nice and loud. How do penguins communicate? How do penguins communicate, right? Excellent, excellent question. Uh, you know the the um, they vocalize. Maybe you can hear in the in the back during my talk. Listen to that. So they vocalize. They do like like donkeys. I, I'm going to I'm going to imitate them, but it's similar to this. It goes like huh, 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 huh. that's the way they they communicate each other. Can you listen to that one? Well, it's gone now. So that's the way they communicate. And they, they have like different ways to communicate. Sometimes they do that when uh, they are defending their nests. So they are telling the other, the other ones, hey, don't get close to my nest. This is my territory. Sometimes what they do is like uh, after they, they fight, they, you know, they fight a lot. And then they say, hey, I am the winner. So they go huh, huh, like, a, like a winner bray. Uh, <laughs> and, and some some other cases, uh, there is a, a very strange uh, way when when they don't find a, a a partner, you know, when they don't find a female, they go like, huh, huh, like a sad vocalization. So they have different kinds of ways to communicate. Hmm? All right, we're gonna take a quick question from uh, our online community, uh, Mrs. Woodlands class is wondering, when it rains a lot, do they abandon their nests? Absolutely fantastic question, because uh, normally they look for places that they, with, with a soil composition where they can, they can dig it and it wouldn't collapse easy. So it's not that easy to also, it's not that easy to, to dig, right? So, um, so, but sometimes like yesterday night when it rained a lot, the the thing is like some nests they flood you know and if there are eggs the eggs they lose the body temperature and they there in some cases if there are chicks they they die into their nest uh, but one of the things that we are having here is related to climate change because there are some studies that show that there's been 
in the last uh, decade, there are more severe storms. And those storms, they come exactly in this time of the year when the chicks are small. So they get wet and those storms, they come with cold wind. So they, li- they, they die because they lose their body temperature. So, so that's a, a, a new kind of mortality, source of mortality, you know, that they didn't have before. All right. Uh, Mrs. Steinhoff's, or Ms. Steinhoff's class is joining us in Guelph, Ontario, grade four students. If you want to turn your mic on and say hi, we'll grab a question. Can you hear us? We gotcha. How's it going, grade fours? Yay! The penguins are pretty loud today, too. Okay. <laughs> Can these penguins be found in Antarctica? Great question. So, uh, these species, no, they don't go to Antarctica. Uh, normally, what penguins like is the food. You know, so they are in places where they can find their, their food uh, close to their colonies. Uh, these ones, they eat anchovies, they eat uh, silver size, small, small species of uh, small fish. They also eat uh, sometimes small squid and, and shrimp. But the, they occupy all the, if you look at the map of South America, they occupy all the southern part of Chile and Argentina. Uh, but only when it's summer. And when the winter comes here, they abandon the colonies and they go to the north because they follow the fish and, and the fish that they like, they go to the north as well. So no, you, won't ha- you won't, will not find these Magellanic penguins in, in Antarctica. All right, let's take a trip to Mrs. Evans' uh, class. They're in Arthur, Illinois. Looks like we have students from a few different classrooms. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, Mrs. Evans' group? Uh, we're doing good. We'd like to say hi. We don't have any questions, but we'd like to say hi. All right. Well, I will check back at the end just in case you've got another one. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's take a quick trip to, let's see, Mrs. Elliott's group, grade five sixes in Vermilion Bay, Ontario. Let me turn their microphone on. And actually, I think you're going to have to give me a big wave if you guys can hear me okay. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. How you guys doing? Good. 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 Who's, who's got the question? Levi? Um, do the penguins have the same, do the penguins ever get the same mate every year? Oh, thank you for that question. <laughs> you know what? Um, so the thing, this is the thing. During one breeding season, let's say from October until March, uh, one female will breed with one male uh, because that is the only way to take care of the chicks and to be able to take care of, the, of them and feed them. So as I told you, when she's in the ocean, he's taking care of them. And when he goes, she comes back all the time. So they never abandon the nest. Uh, so when the, when the season ends in March and they go to Brazil, they don't go together. They don't spend the winter together. But the following season, they are very, what we call, territorial. They love their nests. So the next season, they will tend to come back to the same nest. And in many cases, they meet again and they breed again. So, for example, we follow a couple that had been, has been breeding together for 17 years. And that is amazing. But, of course, they also get divorced. Sometimes they, they, they get divorced. And they get divorced when they are not able to raise their chicks alive. Let's say that there was a storm or maybe a, a fox came here and they lost the eggs or for many other reasons. Or sometimes they don't find enough food, so the chicks die. So when the chicks die, that is the main reason for them to look for another partner. So the next season, they will tend the, to, find, to look for another partner to, to form a couple. All right, we'll steal another question from our online community. I've got a class at Alma Public School, so not too far from me. And they're wondering about when they go out to find food, do they go out alone or in groups, the penguins? (laughs) So they're very social. Uh, When you see them uh, on the colonies, as I told you, some colonies, they do have uh, 400 hectares. It's like four blocks. It's like a city of penguins. Imagine that. So when some of some nests are one kilometer uh, far from their coast. So the things like um, 
they they have like uh, routes and they also have kind of highways you know like avenues so they get together like uh, maybe they don't know each other but they 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 get together on the beach and then they go in groups to to eat to feed in the ocean and that's very useful because when they feed in groups they are more effective so they can get a school of fishes they can surround them and so they they, they push the fishes most of, in many cases, they push them against the surface of the water, you know, because it's like a wall for the fish. So the, the, there's more density of fish and it's much better for them and much easier to catch, catch the food. So, yeah, in many cases, you see them eating in groups. All right. Great questions coming in online uh, from our classrooms joining in virtually. Let's go to uh, Mrs. Lackey's grade five class. They're joining us from Freehold, New Jersey. I'll turn their microphone on. Let's see how they're doing. How are we doing, New Jersey? Hi. Hi. Good. Hi. All right. Who's got a question? All right. Good. If you see that a penguin is sick or needs care, do you help them? I lost the middle of the question. Sorry. <laughs> if you see a penguin is sick, sick or needs care, do you help them? Oh, Joe, I need help there. Yeah, no worries. Uh, she's wondering if you see a sick or injured penguin, will you try to help them? Uh, okay. Uh, you know, these, these penguins are wild animals, you know. And uh, if the, the reason, for example, that they are sick or ill is a natural cause, we just leave them because that's the way, uh, that's the way nature works. Uh, it, in, these penguins sometimes they fight a lot and you see them covering blood but after two days they're brand new I mean you don't <laughs> you don't know how do they do that but you know it's, they go to the ocean and they cure very quickly uh, but we try not to interfere with their lives uh, so this is a, a normal thing uh, the same thing happens when they die we just leave them you know because it, this is part of, of, of nature we try to, to be here to, to disturb them the, the less we can, to get our information with the less impact, and we use our inf information also to, to benefit them. So, no, we don't feed them, uh, we don't cure them, uh, and because this is their life, they, they have their cheeks, you know, they go to the ocean by themselves, they have their own lives, and we try to interfere the less we, we, we can. All right, and let's turn on another microphone. This time we're going to Mrs. Robertson's class. Uh, looks like it's a group of grade eight students joining us in Mississauga, Ontario. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, grade eights? Yeah. All right, who's got a question for us? Um, you said before that um, most species of penguins are becoming threatened. What are uh, what uh, have you done to uh, to conserve these species? Amazing! Thank you for that question. So uh, I I I was trained as a researcher, you know, a, a scientist. But at some point, I realized that I wanted to do more than just create science. I wanted to to generate and do science that can be useful for conservation. So. I founded a, a, an organization that is called, oh, I don't know, it's called the Global Penguin Society. Here's the logo, GPS. It's easy to remember. <laughs> so it's a Global Penguin Society, which is like a network of people that they work in penguin conservation around the, the planet. So we work in science. As I said, we, we have projects like this one here and in other colonies and in other countries like New Zealand or, or, or Chile, other countries and South Africa, uh, Ecuador. So we generate science. We also, uh, in many cases, we discover what are the problems that the penguins are facing and we have the solution. So we look for money and we go to the governments offering a solution and offering help. So, so far, for example, we have been able to protect 3.2 million hectares of habitat for penguins, which is, I don't know if you do acres, it's over 8 million acres. So we create protected areas on land and also in the ocean to protect the, the place where they breathe, like where I am right now, and also to protect the place where they're looking for food. So in that way, we can secure a, a healthy habitat and a safe habitat for the penguins. And the last part of our, the last part of our work is education. So we invest a lot 
also to share what we discover and sharing what are the penguin, what penguins need. For example, we, in many countries, like where I, I am right now in Argentina, also in Africa, uh, uh, other countries in South America, most of the communities and the kids that live very close to the penguin colonies, they've never been able to visit them. So they don't know about them, they don't know, they don't value them. And in many cases, these kids stay in these towns and they're going to become, they're going to decide about the future of these penguins. So we have a, a, a program in which we have taken over 6,000 kids like you to visit, to come and visit the penguin colonies, to learn about them and to see how they can help the penguins. And um, I don't know, maybe you have heard in the past about a game called Club Penguin. Uh, this is a, a game in which you could become a penguin and have fun. So we have a, like a partnership. We collaborate with the, with the game, giving contents and information, and they have helped us to, to, to bring more kids into, the, into the, these colonies. And of course, we have educational material and, uh, and posters with all the penguin species in the planet and books, and that's also part of our education. And soon, I guess later this week, we are going to launch the new website of Global Penguin Society. So next week, after Christmas, make sure that you check on our website and you will find all the information, great pictures and information about every single species that we work with. So there's more, more to learn there as well. All right, very exciting, Poppy, congratulations. Uh, let's you. take one more pop into Mrs. Evans' class, see if they've got a question for us. No, we're good. Thank you. All right. No pressure. So, Poppy, before we uh, sign off, there's one more question from online that we'll take. Um, Ohio, seventh graders are wondering, um, are there lots of other people in other places studying penguins? How many other places? Yeah, yeah. As I, as I mentioned before, it's, it's great. I mean, because there's great researchers and, and fantastic people working to, to benefit penguins. So you have, for example, in every single, I would say that in many places where you have penguins in the Southern Hemisphere, there's been studies. Not, not in all, uh, but I mean, there are researchers in New Zealand, in Australia, in, in Chile, Peru, Ecuador, South Africa, Namibia. Uh, and of course, you have uh, researchers from the state, from Canada, from Europe that go to Antarctica or come to our places. And we work together in groups to, to get more information and, and, and to benefit penguins. But still, there are lots of things to do. Sometimes we think that everything is done, everything is discovered, and that's not true. I mean, there are so many mysteries in this planet and particularly about nature that we still need to explore. So many places still to explore and, and, and things to, to learn. So there's, there's a lot to, to do. There's a lot really a lot to explore. And of course, uh, the more you study, the more you can benefit these species. So that's a great thing uh, about science. But there are penguins that we don't know almost anything about them. There are some penguins in New Zealand that, I mean, there are, there's no information about them. So we still need a lot of people like you to, you know, to work uh, and to, to work to benefit the oceans and, and benefit the penguins. Maybe you want to be a conservationist or a biologist. Maybe you want to be an engineer. Maybe you, you, I mean, there are many, many ways and many careers that you can have in your life and still work for the conservation of this planet. All right. Well, that's a great point. Hopefully we have lots of future penguin scientists out there. Um, Poppy, thank you so much. I wish we could do this all day long. Uh, but we, we've come to the time where we should start wrapping up the Hangout. Classrooms, thank you so much for the amazing questions. Please send them in. Um, any pictures you take in your classroom, use the hashtag Explore Classroom and um, uh, tag at Night Geo Education. And then, Poppy, where can they follow you on social media? So uh, we are on, on Facebook, Global Penguin Society, Instagram and Twitter as well, GPS Penguins. So we are everywhere. <laughs> So look for Global Penguin Society, and, and I'm, I am a very good email answerer. So I, I'm, I'll be very happy to answer to your questions. Perfect. Well, again, uh, Poppy, thanks so much. That was a ton of fun. Please thank all of those penguins for us. Uh, we enjoyed hanging out with them. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we look forward to doing more stuff like this in the future. Yeah, I love to 
Hey, and thank you so much for joining me. This is fantastic, and I'm so happy to be able to share what we do to benefit penguins. All right, let's turn the microphones on, boys and girls, nice and loud, so even the penguins can hear you. Goodbye, and thank you uh, to Poppy. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you. thank you. All right. Once again, everyone, thanks so much for hanging out with us today. Uh, don't forget to check out uh, nationalgeographic.org uh, on slash education. Find Explorer Classroom and lots of more exciting adventures like this. So thanks, everyone, for hanging out, and we'll see you next time.